Phantom Sam. You mean it give you sound a little? Yeah, it's okay. okay. It's, it's new and fun. Okay. Thank you. 27 January 1983, this is Joe Tarr, interview with Chaplain Lewis Alder. Chaplain Alder, when were you born? Born on October 20th, 1927. Where? Ogmoggy, Oklahoma. Okay. And who was your father? My father was Lewis B. Alder. He was a minister in Oklahoma, different churches in Oklahoma, served also as an army chaplain. And at the time that I was born, he was a missionary under the Home Mission Board. <coughs> okay. Who was your mother? My mother was Zula, Z-U-L-A, Buchanan Alder. Where were your parents from? My mother was from Texas. My father was from Missouri. Uh, but at the time they met, he was a resident of Hugo, Oklahoma and attended school at Burleson Junior College in Greenville, Texas, where he and my mother met. How come your parents came to Oklahoma? I don't know why my father's family came to Oklahoma. Uh, I never, I, I have very few memories of my grandfather because he died when I was a small boy. I can remember my grandmother living in the old home at Hugo, Oklahoma. So he came to Oklahoma with his parents many years ago. Mm -hmm. And you say your father was superintendent of? Yeah, my father was the superintendent of the New Yorker Mission uh, Orphan's Home and School for Indian Children outside of Oklahoma. He, okay. was, al he was also a uh, pastor of the uh, little church in New Yorker. Is that for the Creek Indians? I think it was for the Creek Indians. But I think there were some Choctaw Indians there too. What do you remember about the school? I remember uh, many things about the school. I remember the old uh, two-room schoolhouse where my father and mother both taught school. Um, I remember many of the legends and stories and ghost stories about the school that the Indian children used to talk about. I can remember my parents talking about these things from time to time too after we had left there. But in the schoolhouse there was a bell at the top of the school building that uh, would occasionally ring without anybody anywhere near it. The children believed that this was the ghost of, of an old teacher that came back and rang the bell. Uh, apparently what had happened was that after they would ring the school bell, the bell would lodge in the belfry and then gradually work itself loose and would, the clapper would hit the bell one time because they would only get one ring. That seemed to be the explanation of that phenomenon. Uh, in the boys' dormitory, there was a dining room that uh, uh, where in which you could go at, at night and the lights would be turned out and you could see eyes looking at you in the darkness of the door of the dining room and the children were very frightened of that. I remember my, my mother telling about going to these eyes and placing her hand over them and she found that her hand when they turned the lights on her hand was against the, one of the pillars that supported the roof of the dining room and apparently someone had worked in some phosphorus. Uh, into the woodwork of that, which appeared to be eyes looking at people in the dark. I remember stories about uh, the old swimming pool, not swimming pool, but just a pond out behind the, uh, behind the house. My parents, uh, my father used to baptize people from the church in New York and the Indian children in that pond, but uh, the children wouldn't swim in it because they feared uh, that there was a demon or the ghost of an Indian in it that pulled them under the water. Um, one of the things that happened at uh, our at the house in Kachali, which was the girls' dormitory, my father, mother, and I, and my sister, who was born three years after I, lived downstairs in, in this uh, dormitory building. Um, but one of the things that happened there was uh, some kind of an experience. The, the children said that ghosts would slap them in the face. And uh, my mother described it, having experienced it, 
as feeling some kind of an atmospheric pressure on the face and you could feel your breath bouncing back in your face sometimes. It almost felt as though someone had their hand over your face and you could feel your breath coming back. The children believed that these were ghosts that came in and harassed them or slapped them in the face. One of the amusing incidents that took place was that there was a door, screen door, to the um, uh, dormitory that if you put your foot on the um, on the, the wood of the floor if directly behind that door that it would re release the pressure somehow that door would swing open in your hand and uh, we had a, a an old cook who cooked for us and lived in town and one night my father and mother visited with her. She stayed after work until it became very dark, very late. And they regaled her with stories of the superstitions and uh, of the ghost of the, of the place. And she finally became very frightened and said to my father, you must take me home because I'm too frightened to go home by myself. As they started out the door, the door opened in her hand and she fell back in a dead faint in my father's arms. Well, there were many, there were many things. My mother uh, was kind of an amateur uh, ghost debunker, and she was able to interpret most of the phenomena that, that took place there. But the home was um, had been owned by the Presbyterians in the past. And I read in Daily Oklahoma not too long ago that someone has bought the property and that there's one building still existing. When I was there, uh, there were three dormitories, and a schoolhouse. But one building is still existing, and that's the one in which we made our home, which was a girl's dormitory. Mm -hmm. yeah. hmm. What did the buildings made of? They were large, two story, except for the schoolhouse, uh, frame buildings. Can you describe the inside of the girl's dormitory? Yeah, upstairs there were uh, bedrooms and several children, as I recall, uh, slept uh, several children in each bedroom. There was, I remember the old staircase that went upstairs. And as I recall, the buildings were pretty well run down, even when I was there back in 27 to 32. Uh, downstairs uh, was the uh, apartment, several bedrooms, two or three bedrooms for uh, the superintendent and his family, and then a large dining room. How large were these bedrooms? I don't remember, to tell you the truth. I was so small when I was, I was only five years old when I went in there. And there were four buildings total in the middle? Well, uh, when I, I, recall, I recall four buildings, three dormitories and uh, the uh, schoolhouse. And this is just outside of Oak Mulgee? Well, it's outside the little town of New Yonka, which is outside of Oak Mulgee. Uh, now, did the church send your father here, or? Uh, my father was, yes, in, in Baptist organization, we have a, a foreign mission board and a home mission board. Home mission board is concerned about missions in the United States. Mm -hmm. And um, my father was employed by the home mission board and served there until the Depression uh, closed it down. There were no longer enough funds to continue operating it. And so in 1932, we left there. My father moved to Martha, Oklahoma, where he became pastor of the Baptist Church of Martha. Um, so the Baptist Church owned the mission? Um, at that time. Okay, when mm -hmm. did the Baptist take it over from the Presbyterian? I don't know. That, that's a bit of history that I don't have at my fingertips. Mm -hmm. um, can you? explain and describe exactly how the mission is operated, the administration of it. I don't know a whole lot about that because I was so young, but I do remember that my father was uh, the director and the administrator of it. Um, he ran both sides of it, which included the room and board uh, orphan's home type of thing, and also the school. He was the administrator on both sides of it. How many students were there at one time? 
I'm sorry, I just I just don't know. Did your father tell you any stories that you remember about the mission? The main things that I remember about the mission are the ghost stories that my mother told me. Those are the stories that I remember. I remember some of my acquaintances, my Indian friends. I heard one little boy particularly that I played with, and I have some anecdotes about that if, if you think yeah, that would be sure. particularly helpful. Yeah. This little boy was named Benjamin Tiger, and uh, he was so ornery. He was about my age, maybe about a year older than I. He was such a rascal that they called him Wildcat, and he was pretty wild. Um, but he appreciated things. He appreciated a brand new tie that someone gave him. And uh, as he was had gone to bed one evening, and uh, they checked the children to see if they were in their beds and if they were properly dressed for the night, they discovered that Wildcat had no clothes on at all, but he had his tie on. <laughs> and uh, I mean, one of the main things I remember about Wildcat was that he uh, pulled the tail off of a cocktail rabbit, and. Uh, in retribution, someone took that tail and pinned it to him. And he was quite a character. Another incident that I remember was that he and I were playing in some kind of an old, now this is another bit that comes back to me, some kind of an old shed, uh, and we're climbing around in the roof of it. And he got stuck and couldn't get out. The dinner bell rang. I went to dinner, forgot all about Wildcat until much later, people began to ask, where is Benjamin Tiger? And I remembered, I told him that he was stuck up in the attic or the roof of this old shed. Is he related to Jerome Tiger? I don't know. Uh, I think Tiger seems to be a common name. Common name. Are you familiar with Jerome Tiger? Uh -huh. He's the Indian artist. Is that right? He's dead now. Uh -huh. But, uh, no, I think he, Jerome Tiger was Seminole, I think. Is that right? Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, and so the, the depression. Yeah, the depression closed it down. Uh, this is one thing I remember my parents saying about it. The reason that they left there was because there were no more funds to operate. Do you remember what the average day at the school was like at the mission? What oh. time the kids would get up to go, what kind of meals? I remember, I remember that they uh, that the meals were served in dormitory style, and I remember that we ate, we did not do our own cooking, we ate in the dormitory with the children, uh, and they were served family style around the tables, and the, the day began fairly early with the children rising and uh, going to breakfast, and then uh, I remember even though I was too young to go to school, that I would sometimes go to school where my parents taught, just simply to have something to do. And I remember that the uh, school day, uh, that the day was pretty well filled with school activities. I remember the evenings especially, and that uh, the two, the men's, dorm, the boys' dormitory and the girls' dormitory uh, were directly across uh, a large kind of a mall from each other. There was a sidewalk, as I recall, that connected and joined the two buildings together, but there was a large grassy area between the two buildings. And I remember how pleasant the evenings were with people sitting on porches and watching the children. And I participated and shared with the other Indian children, the Indian children, as we played on the grass in the evening hours. So the, the evening hours stand out very much in my memory. What, was the, what did the meal consist of? What did they have for breakfast and lunch and dinner? I don't remember, but I do remember, uh, I remember how amazed I was that food would appear. I somehow had the idea that all a person had to do was to put a skillet or a pan on the stove and somehow there would be, the, the food would be there. And I remember that it was about that time I learned that somebody had to put food in pans. I remember the chickens and the hens. I remember going out and gathering eggs. So I'm sure we had a lot of eggs for breakfast because one of my chores was to gather the eggs. And very often I would put them in my pockets and they'd be smashed by the time I got them back up to the, to the dormitory. Yeah, I was going to ask about the chores that yeah. you had to do and the Indian children had to do. Yeah, uh, those are the chores that I remember. Uh, were, were 
were gathering eggs, of course that was my tender age, that was about all I was able to do. But I'm, sh I'm certain that Indian children had chores. They were very well supervised. They were very closely supervised. And you left there and you went to Marco, Oklahoma? Uh, yeah, my father pastored at Marco, Oklahoma. Okay. And uh, how long did you stay there? Well, we stayed at Marco. Uh, I was five when we left uh, Duyaka, or almost five. And we stayed at Martha until the um, middle of my second grade. And then from there we moved to Sayre, Oklahoma. And my father pastored at Sayre for about three years until I was nearly 10 years old and uh, built the church building at Sayre. He built it after the model of, of uh, there's a Catholic community between Oklahoma City and Sayre. Um, and he visited that church several times because he was impressed with the architecture. The building that we had was an old wooden building. The baptistry was in the floor. Did you ever see a baptistry in the floor behind the pulpit? In order to baptize people, they'd have to roll back the carpet, pull up the trap door, and fill the water. And uh, uh, that's where the people were baptized. Now, I was baptized in that church later after my father had built the new building. The old building called the fire once and he called the fire department. And uh, some of the church officers jokingly suggested to him that he should have let it burn because it was in such a dilapidated condition. But they finally did clear the property and built the, the, the new building, which is the existing building of the church of Sarah. From there, we went to Bolaigs. My father pastored at Bolaigs for uh, five years from the time I was almost 10 until the time I guess I was almost 15, 1942, we left. My father, uh, we were there in uh, when, the, when World War II broke out. I can remember visiting in the home of an Indian family. My father continued an interest in Indians. While we were at Bow Lakes, we, we used to go to Indian campgrounds and camp meetings. And we had an Indian family who was a member of our church. And we were in his home when we heard the news on the radio Sunday afternoon that uh, Pearl Harbor had been attacked. Um, so in, my father immediately, even though he was 45 or 46 at that time, began to try to go on active duty as a chaplain. He had been a sailor in World War I, and he tried to go to Navy, but he was a year too old for the Navy. But he finally was accepted by the Army. And he went, uh, he, he went on active duty in 1942 and was stationed at uh, Fort Warren, Wyoming. We stayed there for two years, and my father uh, went overseas. After the, uh, in the meantime, I had finished high school and uh, was, had a year of college under my belt. And when my father came back from overseas, he came back to Martha, which was place he had pastored after he left New York and then he came back in 1945 and had a heart attack in late 45 and had another one in uh, 46 and died in, uh, at Martha in August of 46. How big is the town of Martha? Martha well, was and still is a very small town. At the time that I was there, it was my first grade experiences, it had a, uh, it had I think it had a, uh, yes, I'm sure it did, all the way through high school. Now the high school part's closed down, and my understanding is that it's only a grade school there. The Methodist Church is closed down there in Martha. There were two churches, Methodist and Baptist, and now at the present time, there's only the Baptist Church. Uh, the bank is gone. Uh, many of the things about the town have, have gone has become quite small. Is it a farming community maybe? It was a farming community. It was a cotton and wheat community. Mm -hmm. Bolex was an oil field community, had been. And uh, at the time my father was at Bolex, it was a population of about 350, but including our mission stations, we had sometimes around 500 in Sunday school because he had five mission stations in, in school buildings in different oil field communities rather clustered around about the lakes and he used OBU students, Oklahoma Baptist University students to come out and this is where some of them got their beginning 
experience in preaching and in ministry. And they would run the Sunday school on Sunday morning at all these places and then consolidate everything on Sunday night at the main church. Uh, when your father moved around, did the church send him or did the different churches? Well, he was called when he, when he went from one church to another. Yeah, he, he was called, he, he moved to another church because he was called by that other church to be their pastor. And he would resign the church that he had served and then we would go up to this other church. Uh, a lot of our experiences at Martha were during the Depression days. I don't remember being poor, but I guess we were because my parents had told me that there were times that the church was not able to pay hardly any, if any, salary at all. But there was always food that would appear on, uh, on, the, on the porch. Do you know what a pounding is? A pounding. Uh -huh. A pounding is when they pound the preacher. And, and it's, I, I, it's happened to me in my ministry, too. But, uh, it's kind of usually a surprise, and the people all come together at one time, and they bring canned goods and sugar and uh, uh, other kinds of foodstuffs, and that's generally the way of welcoming the pastor to a small rural church. And so they did this frequently for my father. And sometimes, sometimes food would just appear on the front porch. Um. So you all survived the depression pretty well. Yeah, as far as I as far as I can remember, we were well to do. Did you do any work for the war effort in World War II? Myself? Yeah. Uh, no, I was in high school. Um, I finished high school about the time the war was over. Okay. So you didn't go out and collect cans and paper. Oh and yeah, I can remember. I remember even Bolex. We we collected uh, aluminum foil and would pick up cigarette. Packages of gold aluminum foil, you know, and other items like that, take them to Seminole and uh, deposit them at a collection place. And of course, we bought bonds and uh, war bonds. And we, uh, I remember the rationing days, the uh, uh, stickers on the automobiles, and the food rationing, too, the ration, ration cards that you had. Uh, did your father serve in the uh, European theater? No, he served in the Pacific. Pacific. Yeah, he went from Fort Warren, Wyoming to um, uh, to Hawaii, to Honolulu, Hawaii. He served as the chaplain for the 147th uh, Hospital there, which treated patients who had been wounded in uh, the Pacific Theater. And then uh, I spent 20 years as an Army chaplain, and one of my assignments was in Hawaii with the with Triple Army Medical Center, which was the uh, Administrative descendant, if you will, of the 147th Hospital, where he had served as chaplain. When did you join the Army? I joined the Army in 1953. I was stationed in Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. And I served for two and a half years in Oklahoma, in Korea, and Hawaii. And then uh, came back, went back to seminary and got a, an advanced degree. Came back to Oklahoma, pastored here in Oklahoma City. And went back into the army and served out the balance of my 20 years mm -hmm. and finished my last assignment uh, at Fort Sill again. So I began and finished my. Okay, okay. you were too late for Korea, weren't you? Uh, no, when I, well, when I went in in, in 1953, the Korean War was still old, still on. I went in in uh, June of 53, and it was in the summer of 53 that they reached an amnesty, not an amnesty, but a, what do you call it? A, ceasefire. Honestly. Yeah, a ceasefire. Uh, in July of 54, I, I went to Korea, and the war was still officially on, but uh, uh, there was no hostility at that particular time. But I was in Vietnam during conflict. Okay. What unit did you serve with in Vietnam? I served with the 3rd Brigade of the 4th Infantry Division. I was the brigade chaplain, senior chaplain. And uh, it came under the operational control of the 25th Infantry Division. And since I uh, left Vietnam, it was assigned to the 25th instead of the 4th. Mm -hmm. Do you have any experiences in Vietnam that are interesting that you'd like to talk about? Well, I hadn't thought about uh, I mean, There were a lot of experiences there. I, mean, uh, I remember the, uh, oh, I remember Christmas. I remember the guys trying to decorate little trees to make Christmas. We were, we were in a base camp. We were in our base camp 
was the Michelin Rubber Plantation. And it was made up, uh, it had uh, some old French villas in it. And we pitched our tents in uh, the rubber trees. It was still an active plantation. And we could, I, I can remember the um, Vietnamese people gathering the sap from the rubber trees and taking it into the uh, Dao Ting, which was the name of the town next door to us, and to the rubber factory and, and processing the rubber there. Uh, I don't know how much you want me to tell you about Vietnam. I can tell you a whole lot about Vietnam, but I don't know how much you want to get into on that. We were at Dao Ting to go over to Tien, basically. Did you go in the uh, Godoma's Temple at Tien? Yeah, uh huh. The, uh, what was the name of that uh, religion? The Khao Dai religion. Yeah, yeah Khao Dai. The Khao Dai religion. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that was a fascinating place to visit. Did you visit there? Yeah, I've been inside the temple. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know one thing about the uh, Kadoas? Yeah, the, the Khao Dai religion was uh, started by a group of Buddhist monks who were involved in spirit writing. And they were, they would, uh, do some automatic, they would just let their hands run free. It's kind of like working a Ouija board. And um, they began to feel that they were being impressed by uh, some spirit or by God to record and to write down this new theology and new religion. And um, it is a religion that is a very eclectic kind of a thing that draws from the different uh, uh, religions of the world. It draws from Buddhism, it draws from Christianity, it draws from Islam, and you can see it in the architecture. Some of the minarets reflect uh, some of the architectural things there reflect uh, the Islam faith. Uh, but they believe that truth is to be found in all religions and that the essence of their religion is to pull all this together. One of their sons is Victor Hugo because uh, they appreciated his concern for the oppressed and the downtrodden people of Paris. And that comes out of the French language and culture that was a part of Vietnam for so many years. But we had, uh, I had three chaplains working for me. We had uh, a total of three Protestant and one Catholic chaplain. And we, we made it as our goal to have worship services for all of our troops. Now they were scattered out all over the field. The base camp, as you well know, was a place where you'd come back to. Uh, but most of the time, the troops were out there in the field on search and destroy missions. We had an armored uh, uh, infantry battalion, and the, others were, the other two were straight leg infantry, and we had uh, field artillery too. And uh, But we would go out, the, the one priest, would, would have as many services as he could in consolidated areas. But the Protestant chaplains and I would fly in resupply missions with the helicopters and we would go into wherever the unit was and sometimes we'd have services on a platoon level. Um, because we'd go wherever the unit was and uh, ride in, in the resupply helicopter, maybe stay all day, maybe stay all night. Uh, or maybe go out in search and destroy missions with the troops, but most of the time we waited until they got set so that we could fly in and out and go from one place to another. And we pretty well can, uh, covered uh, every week. We'd have anywhere from 35 to 40 worship services to cover the entire brigade. Kept you busy. Yeah, sure did, but it was a good ministry. We built a chapel at um, Camp Evans. Camp Evans. Up north. Uh -huh. And when we moved up there, it was just all tents. Mm -hmm. And we had uh, chaplains over from Mexico. Yeah. So we got together and decided we needed a chapel. Yeah. And we had a ration of, of beer and a Coke a day. Mm -hmm. And there were three companies saved their ration of beer for about two months. Exactly. The general flew that to Janang and paid them that to the Navy for lumber. Exactly. And we flew we flew the lumber back up and we built the chapel out of that exactly. lumber. We built two chapels, but we scrounged from from the supply. I, I hate to tell you uh, where we got our stuff because we'd almost be put up for stealing. I, I, I've been through that too. I don't know what you do. Yeah. yeah. And uh, let's see, so this is going to say that we did over there. Um, One thing I was going to say was that, are you still over there? Yeah. One thing I was going to say was that in this rubber plantation, they had a little swimming pool. And when we got in there, it was full of mud and rubber trees. 
and we were able to clean it out and put a filter on it and pump fresh water. I baptized in it, and but we, we cleaned it up, and you'd, be, you'd have the interesting kind of thing, maybe of a man being one day out on a search and destroy mission, and the next day uh, in a swimming suit enjoying the luxury of a beautiful French built swimming pool. But it was a very important morale factor. I would make sure you that. As an overall thought, what do you think about our business in Vietnam? Is that a fair question? Yeah, that's a fair question. I think the uh, cause was just. I, I saw with my eyes a village that had walked all the way from the north to the south in order to be free. And I saw the rubber plantation and I was there when the uh, um, manager of the plantation was kidnapped. I went out on a search and destroy mission with the troops one day and I saw hordes of rice that had been stolen by the Viet Cong from the, from the villagers. And the first day I arrived, I saw a uh, Jeep that had the flesh of a little boy embedded in it because he was, used, he was being used by the VC to set up a Claymore mine. And a target of opportunity came along and they exploded it before he got out of the way. And uh, you know, I saw things that convinced me that the cause was just. Now, whether it was proper politically to be there or not, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I think the cause was just. Mm -hmm. Do you regret? Uh, what was BJ Day like? Forty-five. BJ Ward. BJ Day. Uh, I guess I remember more about the bomb than I do with the BJ Day itself. That was kind of, to me, it was kind of an anti climax. What do you think about the bomb? There are a lot of mixed feelings about the bomb. I know it shortened the war and I know it saved American lives, but I think it was, it ushered us into a There are a lot of mixed feelings about the bomb. I know it shortened the war and I know it saved American lives, but I think it was it ushered us into a, a new and tragic day. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything else to say about the mission? Or? No, I can't think of anything else. Okay. When did you get married? In uh, 1951, okay. March 23rd. Have any kids? Four boys. Grandkids? Seven grandchildren. One grandson and six granddaughters. Well, I think this is a good interview. I hate to rush, but I'm going to have to. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Okay.